Today we will uh, get into the subject of electro-optic modulators, having finished the discussion on uh, lasers. There are various types of lasers which I have not discussed in detail, such as uh, blue lasers uh, based on gallium nitride, uh, zinc selenide. Uh, the fundamental principles are the same, although the material systems are different. Um, also, I have not uh, discussed uh, things like quantum cascade lasers for lack of time, but I'll get into uh, the subject of electro-optic modulators because these modulators are used to switch the laser on and off. If you want to carry any information from a laser, then the laser has to be modulated. The simplest way of uh, modulation is by injection current modulation. If you vary the injection current on and off, you can switch a, um, a laser. Uh, that is often done, but in many cases where you don't want chirp, or if you want a, um, a high power laser, for example a solid state laser which cannot be turned on and off very fast, then you will use an electro-optic modulator. So let's get into the subject of uh, electro-optic The idea is that if you have a, a laser which can be turned, which is, say, CW, the laser light will pass through the modulator, uh, then into the, say, the fiber then it will go to the detector um, and the demodulator to recover the signal. This modulation can be of two types, obviously analog or digital. It is mainly digital modulation which is used because you can get a higher signal-to-noise ratio. You can get very um, high-speed switching. Um, and this is exactly what is used in uh, fiber optic communication. Also in space communication, as you know, uh, for um, satellite communication also we use digital, various types of digital modulation. Until the advent of quantum wells, uh, modulators were of one type practically. They were based on nonlinear optic crystals. such as uh, lithium niobate uh, for one, in which the refractive index, these are also called electro-optic materials, okay, electro-optic materials, in which either the refractive index or the absorption coefficient could be varied. Typically, in this case, the uh, refractive index, uh, N, is a function of the electric field. Okay. So, in this case, then the velocity of the optical signal passing through the medium can be modulated by varying the electric field. So in this case, we have what is known as phase modulation. Uh, we can also have amplitude modulation in uh, certain materials in which alpha is a function of it. Okay. So these uh, modulators are based on the phenomena of electroabsorption. The absorption coefficient is varied with the electric field. And towards the beginning of the course, we have seen that, for example, uh, there are a couple of effects. There is the, for 
electroabsorption there is the Franz Keldish effect and uh, the Stark effect okay both change the absorption coefficient alpha um, as a function of electric field. And so these are essentially electroabsorption modulators. Okay. But these have certain disadvantages. For example, these effects uh, are seen at very high fields. So uh, earlier on for bulk materials, um, high electric fields, high of the order of 10 to the power, say, 5 volts per centimeter, etc. Okay. So for bulk materials, this was really uh, not very practical. But now when um, quantum wells or very thin layers are being grown, if you apply, say, 10 volts across 1 micron, you get this. Okay. So 10 volts across 1 micron is, gives you 10 to the power 5 volts per centimeter. So there is a version of this uh, which is being used now, which is called the quantum confined Stark effect, which is very important both as a modulator and as a switch, QCSC for short, and I'll come to this later on. Okay. But the conventional um, modulators, uh, they're based on crystals, nonlinear optic crystals, okay. Which must be obviously transparent to the light, uh, such as lithium niobate, lithium tantalate, and uh, the family of other materials such as, um, um, okay, barium titanate, same. Notice that uh, many of these are ferroelectric, okay. We can use quartz also, which is not uh, ferroelectric, but piezoelectric, okay. So crystalline quartz, that's SiO2. Uh, what is the phenomena involved? The phenomena is... Uh, very well understood from the point of view of crystal physics. Uh, we have uh, the linear electro-optic effect displayed by crystals without inversion symmetry. Okay. So this rules out materials like silicon, germanium, um, diamond, etc. And we know out of the 32 crystal classes, the 21 crystal classes that show this. Okay. So we have to choose one of the 21 crystal classes. And uh, that's why uh, these materials are all in this 21 crystal classes. Okay, now um, we are talking about the change of refractive index with um, electric field, and these are materials in which we have uh, the refractive index is direction dependent. Okay, um, so The refractive index in different directions is different. Say this is Nx, Ny, Nz. So this is the um, ellipsoid. It's called the index ellipsoid. And The propagation is given by the equation x squared 
over nx squared plus y squared over ny squared plus z squared over nz squared, um, where x, y, and z are parallel to the principal dielectric axes, and the d is parallel to E, and Z is the uh, propagation direction. Um, now, we know that these NX, N is a function of electric field, so as a result, with electric field, we have the relation 1 by n squared, 1 x squared, plus 1 by n squared, 2 phi squared, plus 1 by n squared, 3 z squared, plus 2, where these are the cross terms, y z plus 2 over 1 by n squared 5xz plus 2 over 1 n squared 6xy is equal to 1, where 1, 2, 3 are the x, y, z, z directions, and these 4, 5, 6 are these uh, cross products. This can be simplified if we If, as we said, x, y, z are parallel to the dielectric axes, then this is simplified, becomes 1 by n squared 1, e is equal to 0, is just 1 by n x squared, okay, and so on. So, and the rest are 0. By choosing proper axes, the cross terms are zero. Okay. So then the equation becomes simplified to with the uh, application of an electric field, delta 1 by n squared is given by j equal to 1 to 3. R I J um, E J. Okay, this is the effect of electric field, and these are the R I J are the electro optic tensors which determine the effect of the larger this is, then the larger the change in uh, refractive indices. And here um, 1 is equal to x, okay, i, 1 is equal to x, 2 is equal to y, and uh, 3 is equal to z. And this electro-optic tensor is determined by the crystal symmetry. Okay, so this is a, we can write this equation in matrix form. We have Okay, this is a column matrix with six terms I'm going to is equal to the R is a um, three by six matrix R one one R one two R one three etc. Going to one R six one R six two R six three and then we have E's uh, e1, e2. Okay. Okay. These tensors are like um, what you have for, say, piezoelectric effect, etc. For six, um, these are. Um, this is a six by three matrix. 
and uh, this depends upon the crystal symmetry. So, due to symmetry, we, we will not have 18 independent terms. We will, um, through group theoretical arguments, you can um, show that some of these will cancel out. Let us take some of the uh, most important uh, crystal classes. If you have tetragonal, 4 mm, this is like barium titanate. Then, if we denote the ones that are zero by dots, then we have only a, a limited number of components. Okay, the R, these are three, three. Okay, then we have all these are zero. R four two. R for two. Okay. So the higher the symmetry, obviously the larger, uh, the lower the number of components. So in this case, what we have is R uh, four one is um, okay. Um, What we've got R, uh, sorry, let's look, look at this. R13 is equal to R23, okay? Um, so sometimes we can uh, denote it like that, and we can denote like that. These two are the same. And so there are one, two, three independent components, okay? So this simplifies the, uh, the calculations. Suppose you take uh, another, this is one, one example. If you take uh, another very well-known uh, nonlinear optic crystal, potassium dihydrogen phosphate, okay, KDP. This has a crystal class bar 42M. And for this, R41 is equal to R52. And the only other one, R63, is not equal to 0. Okay. Now, what about uh, cubic crystal classes? There must be presence of in, um, lack of inversion symmetry. Okay, so uh, materials like um, gallium arsenide, belonging to zinc plane structure, okay, uh, they also fall in this category, and we have. R41 is equal to R52 is equal to R63. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, there is only it's very symmetrical because this is zinc blend. Okay, if you go to diamond structure, then there'll be zero. Okay, there is no um, electro optic effect at all in diamond. You can understand that there has to be uh, some. Uh, amount of ionicity in the crystal, okay? Because if you're applying an electric field, the positive and negative charges must, uh, the electron clouds must uh, vary with the, elect with the electric field. If you have just carbon or silicon or, di or germanium, all the crystals, are the, all the atoms are the same, okay? So there's good, going to be no asymmetric effect. So these are the main uh, important materials. Okay, there are, there are a few more. Um, I've talked about Trigonal class. Trigonal is uh, quartz. Quartz is a very important from the point of view of uh, piezoelectric materials. And tellurium is also in this trigonal class. And crystal class 32. And here we have R11 is equal to minus R21 is equal to minus R62. And R41 is equal to minus R52. Okay. So how is this? Uh, in if you look up books on uh, crystal physics, you find that this is deno denoted by a matrix of this type.
Um, okay, what does this mean? And these are connected like this. We, we connect. Okay, so what is this? This is R11, and this is minus R21. Okay, this is positive. These are positive, and this is negative. So that is the way that's connected. And uh, this is equal to minus R62. Okay, so this is minus R62. So. And R41 is equal to R minus R52. R41 is equal to minus. All the rest are zero. Okay. So this, if you look up, for example, um, um, Nye's book, Crystal Physics, you'll find that these tensors are given not only for uh, uh, nonlinear optic crystals, but for piezoelectric tensors, uh, the thermal conductivity. Um, tensors, the um, um, elastic coefficients, okay, I've used the elastic coefficients when I calculated uh, the strain, okay, the elastic coefficient tensor, that is also dependent upon the crystal class, okay. Um, so this is a, a sort of notation which is very common. Uh, 3M class is what has lithium niobate and lithium tantalate, and uh, and for this these are not very symmetrical. So if you have lack of symmetry, you have a large number of components. Again, okay, minus R six two, R four two is equal to R five one, and R one three is equal to R two three. Okay. So there are three independent components. Now, this just gives us, so this Rij, electro-optic tensor, depends upon the crystal class. Okay, so we can, we know uh, for a particular crystal class what this value, uh, which are present and which are absent. Okay, but then obviously the magnitude will determine the magnitude of the electro-optic effect. So if I just tabulate uh, the values of uh, the N0 cubed R for important materials. Let's take material KDP. Okay. The electro optic tensors are given in units of meters per volt, 10 to the power minus 12. R41 is equal to 8.6. Uh, 8.6. R63 is 10.6. Okay, the exact values are not important, but now we know that um, there will be a refractive index. The ordinary ray will have a refractive index of a certain value. Extraordinary ray will have a different refractive index. It could be larger or smaller. Okay, and N0 cubed R. This is a Index of um, how nonlinear optical material is. This is 29 and say 34, corresponding to refractive indices being asymmetric. The ref dielectric constant E parallel to C is 20. E perpendicular to C is 45, and this is a point group symmetry. bar for 2M. Okay. Um, okay, I won't uh, give all the materials. Sir, N cube, N zero cube R, what is R? R is that um, the corresponding electro-optic tensor, okay? The tensor which is uh, in that uh, appropriate direction, okay, that is the electro-optic tensor. Uh, let's take, uh, say, barium titan. Let's take, okay, the one with lithium niobate. Okay, lithium niobate is 3M. Lithium niobate, there, there's so many components. There are R33, R13, R22, R42. I won't give you the exact values. N0 is 2.29. NE is 2.20. Okay, Corris if you, okay. This is say 30.8, this is 
3.4, this is 28. The thing to notice is this N0, N E cubed R33, R33, this one, okay, this one, is large. Okay, this is 328. And N O cubed R22 R is 37. And we know this is a ferroelectric material, so E uh, parallel to C is 50, E perpendicular to C is 98. Okay. So notice that this is, this is a very large value. Suppose you take uh, uh, let's take a different crystal class. Lithium tantalate is, is uh, somewhat similar. Let's uh, take, say, gallium arsenide. Okay, gallium arsenide at 10.6 microns where it's transparent. Uh, this belongs to bar 4, 3M. And there is only one uh, component of R, which is 1.6. Uh, refractive index of gallium arsenide is 3.34. It's isotropic, okay? So without any electric field, the, you know, the refractive, it's not like quartz, okay? It's isotropic, so one refractive index. N0 cubed is 59, um, and epsilon by epsilon 0 is 11.5. Okay. So notice this is, this is much less than, uh, uh, if same system, suppose you go to cadmium telluride, okay? cadmium telluride 6.8, 2.6, 1.20. So, all these materials are, in principle, uh, electro-optic, but uh, lithium niobate is the one that has the highest electro-optic uh, coefficient. Okay. Now, why do we write uh, N cubed R33? How, what is the uh, principle of uh, the electro-optic modulation? The principle is that this is phase modulation, so we take the sample in the form of a rectangular rod okay, of length L. And we're going to use the fact that uh, light is incident. It's, we have a polarizer, okay, which is parallel to X. The orientation of the crystals is, is important. Suppose we take this as X and this as Y. And this is Z, according to crystallographic axes. Um, first one we'll talk about is a longitudinal electro-optic modulator in which we apply the electric field in the longitudinal direction. Okay. Uh, so what's going to happen? The different uh, components are going to move with different velocities. So uh, at the uh, output, at the, you'll put a, here a lambda by 4 plate. which gives you a retardation of pi by 2. It goes, and then you have an out, this is an input polarizer and an output polarizer. And here uh, we adjust this such that the axes are this is parallel to Y, and this is parallel to X. Um, this phenomenon is also called, remember, birefringence. Okay? If you um, have a crystal in which the refractive indices are different in different uh, directions, it's called uh, um, birefringence. And we'll see why we use this. The idea is obviously that if you don't apply any, um, we want linearity of output, and we you know, these are crossed. 
Okay, so that if there is no electric field, probably no signal will, will get through. Um, yeah, yeah, this is 45 degrees, yeah, with respect to this. Okay, so um, this is this is sort of uh, giving you a fixed bias of this uh, pi by 2. We'll see how that works. Okay, so the retardation due to this uh, electro optic material gamma is pi EZL, that's the length, over V pi, where V pi is the voltage giving retardation of pi. Now this V pi is a property of the material. V pi is lambda by twice n0 cubed r63, okay? where lambda is just obviously 2 pi c by omega. So that's why this term, N0, uh, comes in. So the larger this value, the smaller the applied voltage okay, that is required to give the retardation. For ADP, R63 is 8.5, and therefore V pi ADP is uh, 10 to the power 4 volts at lambda is equal to 0.5 microns. Notice most of these crystals that I've taken, ADP, KDP, lithium nibate, they are uh, transparent in the visible region. Okay, They're not like semiconductor, they're mainly transparent. Okay. Um, so this is the field that will give you a retardation of, of pi. Suppose you have an incident field Ex dashed is A cos omega t and Ey dashed is A also cos omega t. Now, what I'm defining is that the incident field is parallel to X, okay, and we are defining. Uh, new coordinates x dashed here and y dashed here. So we have then I out over I in, the intensity of the light, is sine squared gamma by 2. Gamma is the retardation, which is sine pi by 2 V by V pi. Or we have I out by I in is half 1 plus gamma m sine omega m t if gamma m is much less than 1. Where Gamma is equal to pi by 2 plus gamma m sine omega m t. Okay, I think a diagram will try and explain this. S suppose this is a sort of transfer characteristic. Okay. So suppose this is a transmission factor. 
going from 0 to 100 percent. Okay. On this axis, we apply the, the electric field okay. here. So, um, the transfer characteristic is This is the sine squared pi by 2, v by v pi sort of function. Okay. okay. Now, suppose we did not use the... Um, the Um, this pi by 2 plate, okay, then suppose we had the signals like this, the input signal like this, okay. So what would happen, this, this part would get cut off, okay, it would act like a uh, half-wave rectifier. Only this part would be transmitted. So what that uh, pi by 2 plate does is, is to introduce a phase shift constant phase shift here, so that the applied signal now is is biased up, up to there, okay? and then the applied signal okay, um, this is say V pi by 2, and the maximum signal that you can handle is something like you know, something like v pi, and this is this is gamma m. So uh, the characteristic of the modulator is like this. Okay, when you are applying an electric field, where you across the this is a longitudinal modulator, so you are applying the field here. Okay. Um, as a result, uh, the refractive index is changing, the velocities of the two components are changing, and uh, the output characteristic would be, okay, when the electric field is here, the in this is the input, okay, and the output electric field would be here, okay, and so the modulated output would go okay. so the output so the problem with so obviously if you um, if you change the input voltage the uh, the the output signal, the optical signal, the amplitude is, is being modulated okay, with the help of the polarizers and the analyzers. Okay. The problem with uh, such an arrangement is that as we calculated, the value of V pi is something like 10,000 volts. So it is not a um, readily um, adaptable system. So one can, what a much more commonly used are transverse electro-optic modulators. In which the electric, this is L, okay. Of course, then the electric field is applied you know, between here and here, you can say. Also, the advantage is that the electrodes do not interfere with uh, the electrodes are here on top, metal, metal electrodes. They don't interfere with the, with the light. Um, Here you have 
again this analyze the polarizer system output okay this is perpendicular to the input polarizer okay um, and yeah here you have i output by i input again sine squared gamma by 2 gamma is the retardation gamma is the difference between the phase phi z dashed minus phi y dashed it turns out is it's root 3 pi n0 cubed r41 by lambda v l by d where obviously the field here is if we apply a voltage here the field here is v by d okay so v by d is electric field and l is the interaction interaction length so here the advantage is that you can apply if d is much less a uh, few millimeters compared with this you can apply a much um, smaller field and uh, achieve the modulation again you see that the the retardation that you get with the electric field is proportional to n n cubed r okay so that's why this, this is a figure of merit now um, this is a general principle that was demonstrated a long time ago but now the question is what is the maximum how fast can you go because we know we can modulate lasers you know up to uh, gigahertz so what is the maximum bandwidth? Uh, this depends upon the electrical circuitry. After all, what is this um, modulator? It's like a capacitance. Okay, the modulator is like a, a big dielectric sitting where the electric field is applied. And how fast can you charge and discharge this circuit? Okay, so. The equivalent circuit is given in terms of okay, so okay, so L somewhere. So the maximum modulation bandwidth delta F, okay, then delta F is one by two pi. This is the load resistance R L. C okay. There's a finite um, resistance where omega zero squared is. This is the resonant frequency of the circuit one by omega zero squared is one by L C. Okay, and uh, so this is the mod modulation bandwidth. What is the power? Power is equal to V M squared by twice R L. And you can put this in. This is gamma squared, lambda squared, a epsilon n zero is comes in r six three squared comes in. Notice uh, one thing that I forgot to say that um, if this is a ferroelectric material, dielectric constant becomes large. Capacitance becomes large. If capacitance is large, then this is uh, bandwidth becomes small. Okay. So in this case, although a ferroelectric material gives you large R63, but the capacitance also becomes large. So in, in many cases, it is preferable to have a non-ferroelectric material, which will have a lower value of of this uh, dielectric constant. Okay. Um, so notice that the power is proportional to the area, uh, this, this delta nu, um, and inversely proportional to n0 squared r63 squared. What is the maximum frequency at which this modulation can occur? Obviously, it depends upon the velocity nu m max is um that's uh, 
what is omega m tau d? Uh, this is maximum modulation frequency into tau d is uh, pi by 2. So tau d is L n by c. And so um, from this you can work out that this comes to c over 4 L n. Okay. Um, after all, this has a length L. What is the velocity of light? C. Okay. What is the uh, C by n? C by n is the velocity of light in this medium. Okay. And um, if the light uh, must not uh, take too much time to go through this, uh, if it takes too much time, the voltage will change. Okay. Uh, from plus to minus. Okay. So as a result. Uh, it's a question of the light going, uh, the velocity, the time taken by this must be small compared with the frequency of, uh, of um, uh, modulation. Okay? So this is the relation uh, which will come from this. And for KDP, N is 1.5, L says 1 centimeter. Um, it turns out that nu M max from this comes to 5 uh, 10 to the power 9 hertz. Okay. So 5 gigahertz, which is reasonably fast, but still not quite fast enough um, for many purposes nowadays. We can all, always, there's nothing much you can do uh, about, about C. You can reduce L. Okay. Um, N is already rather small. KDP N is small, so uh, nu M can be large. Suppose you go to ferroelectric materials, then N will be, la will be larger and nu M will be small. So this sort of gives you an idea that uh, what is the uh, order of magnitude of the modulation frequency using these electro-optic modulators. Okay. It turns out that uh, modulators based on the quantum confined Stark effect Okay. Multi-quantum bells um, also have nonlinear optic properties, and so I'll take those up next time.